Hey, what's up everybody? In this video, we're going to go over seven of the most common algorithms that you'll see come up in an interview. And there's like an 80% chance that you'll encounter one of these algorithms while interviewing. So it's imperative that you know these seven algorithms. So let's go ahead and get right into it, starting with the two pointers algorithm. The two pointers pattern is basically exactly what it sounds like. We're going to make use of two pointers to keep track of two data points simultaneously. So let's imagine that we have an array that looks like this and a target that is 22. And we want to find the two numbers in this array that add up to the value 22, the target. The naive solution to solving this problem would be to iterate through this input array. And for every index of the array, check every other index's value to see if the two values combined equal our target. As you can see, this solution isn't very efficient because we are unnecessarily iterating through elements that we've already seen before. That is, when we're calculating all of the values in the array with this first value 2, we already see every other number in the array. So in theory, after that first round, we've already accessed the two values that result in 22, those values being 7 and 15. But even so, we still won't realize that with this solution until our second trip around when we calculate all of the values in the array with the second value, 7. Now let's try to visualize the more efficient solution using the two pointers pattern. So remember that two pointers means exactly that. We're going to use two pointers to keep track of two separate values simultaneously. So let's imagine that we have the same array and the same target, 22. This time, we'll place a pointer at both ends of the array, hence two pointers. Following that, we simply add the value at the first pointer and the value at the second pointer together to see if they add up to our target. If they don't, we simply check to see which pointer we should move inward by taking into account whether or not our calculated value is less than or greater than our target value. So the important point here is that our array is an ascending ordered array. That means that the values at the end of the array are going to be larger than the values at the beginning. So if our calculated value is greater than our target, that means that we need to decrease the size of our calculated value. We do that by moving our rightmost pointer to the left because remember, the further right we go, the larger the numbers become. So we want to use a smaller number for our addition because our result was larger than the target. Same for if the result wasn't large enough we'd move our smaller number pointer on the left to the right to increase the value of our addition. And as you can see, this is a much more efficient way to solve this problem. The next algorithm that we are going to focus on is the divide and conquer algorithm. And we're actually going to make use of the two pointers algorithm within this algorithm as well. So as you can see, we're kind of building on top of what we've already learned. So let's imagine that you have $100,000 in student loan debt. In this world, for some of us, this might not be far from the truth. And as is common with student loans, your total debt is the sum total of multiple individual loans. Now, unless you're already rich, it's probably not possible for you to pay off the entirety of this debt in one payment. So the usual approach would be to tackle the loans individually, gradually paying each loan off. In other words, once we've divided the 100k debt into individual loans, we can tackle them in isolation from one another. So over time, we'll pay off each individual loan, which will eventually come together to completely pay off our overall debt of $100,000. And this is the divide and conquer algorithm. And that's pretty much all there is to it. We first divide the problem into subproblems of the same related type. So in this case, each subproblem is subtracting debt. And then we conquer where the combined solutions come together to form the solution to the overall problem. So let's apply this to something more technical. We'll use a sorting algorithm called merge sort as an example. We're presented with an array that we want to sort. And the first thing that we do is divide the array down to individual arrays of size 1. Now, an array of size 1 is technically sorted because, of course, there's only one element. So within the conquer portion of the algorithm, we will merge the sorted arrays. And we do this by making use of another algorithm or pattern where we make use of two pointers. So if we have two sorted arrays, we'll start both pointers at index 0 for each array. We then compare the two values referenced by the pointers. 
one is less than two. So we'll take that value first and then we increment the pointer for the right array. Two is less than three. So we take that value and then increment the pointer. Three is less than four. So we take that value and at this point, the pointer on this side can't increment any further. So we then just append the rest of what is pointed to by the other pointer. We're then left with a sorted array. So back to our merge sort visualization. Once we've reached the end of the conquer portion of our algorithm, we're left with a sorted array. And this is divide and conquer. The next algorithm that we're going to focus on is K-Way Merge, and this algorithm is actually going to make use of both the divide and conquer algorithm as well as the two pointers algorithm. So once again, we're building on top of what we've already learned, and you should start to recognize the patterns here. To understand K-Way Merge, we first need to understand how to merge two sorted arrays, which is also known as a two-way merge. So we're given two sorted arrays, and to merge them, we'll make use of two pointers, both of which start at the zeroth index of their corresponding arrays. And from there, we'll compare the values pointed to by the pointers. So here, both 1 and 1 are equal, so it doesn't matter which one we take first. Once we add the value to our merged sorted array, we update the pointer for the value that we used. Now we're comparing 4 with 1. 1 is less than 4, so we'll take 1 and update the pointer. Now we compare 3 and 4. 3 is less than 4, so we take that and update the pointer. Now we compare 4 with 4. These are both equal, so it doesn't matter which one we take first. We'll take the one from the right array and update the pointer. Now we're left with what is at the left pointer. And since we know that whatever is at the left pointer is greater than or equal to whatever is at the end of our merged array, and since the two individual arrays that we are merging are already sorted, we can safely just append the rest of what is left at the left pointer to the end of our merged array. And that's how we merge two sorted arrays, which is also known as a two-way merge. So now that we understand how a two-way merge works, all a k-way merge is is the merging of more than two sorted arrays, k just being a variable for the number of sorted arrays. So for our example, we'll use four sorted arrays. So let's imagine we have an array that contains four sorted arrays as its elements. So we want to do a k-way merge where k is equal to four. That is, we want to merge four sorted arrays. And the way that we're going to do this k-way or four-way merge is by making use of the divide and conquer approach. All we're going to be doing is essentially dividing the arrays until we are left with individual arrays. And from there, we can just group those individual arrays into pairs of two, and then perform a two-way merge on each pair. And as you can see, once we merge a pair of two, it becomes one sorted array, so we can then pair that resulting one array with another resulting one array in another two-way merge until we're left with one sorted array. And that's really all there is to it. It's just taking any number of sorted arrays or k sorted arrays, breaking them up into pairs of two, and applying two-way merge to each pair, all the way until we're left with one sorted array. And that's going to be it for the k-way merge pattern using divide and conquer. Our next algorithm is going to be the sliding window algorithm. And this algorithm also makes use of two pointers. So as you can see, there was a reason that I went over the two pointers algorithm before going over any of the other algorithms. It's important to note that we can break the sliding window pattern down into two types. One that uses a fixed window size and one that uses a dynamically sized window. The problem will determine whether or not your window size will be fixed or dynamic. For now, let's start with the fixed window size. Let's imagine that we have an array of integers. And then let's imagine that we want to calculate the average of the values within a specific subset of that array. For example, say we are asked to calculate the average of a contiguous subarray of size 4 within this array. Contiguous just meaning that all four elements are adjacent or next to one another. So for the sake of this example, we'll do these first four elements. First of all, since the size of the subarray is given to us, because we are asked to calculate the average of a contiguous subarray of size 4, 
4 is the size of our window, a fixed size. So we would add all four of the elements up and then divide the sum by 4 because to calculate the average for a set you simply take the sum of the numbers and divide it by the total number of values in the set. Now let's imagine that we need to find the maximum average when considering all contiguous subarrays of size 4 within the array. Sounds a bit complicated, right? Well, let's break it down. How many contiguous subarrays of size 4 do we have in this array? Remember that contiguous means that all four elements are adjacent to one another. This tiny array is small enough for us to count these sets out. So we have a set of four here, here, and here. Anything beyond that is no longer a subarray of size four. So what we want to do is calculate the average for all three of these subsets and whichever has the highest average is our answer. We keep track of the first sum that was calculated and just subtract the value that's at the starting index of the window and add the value at the index after the current end of the window. This simulates moving the window up. For this to work, we will need to keep track of two indexes, the index at the start of our window and the index at the end of our window. From there, it's just a matter of calculating the average for the window and then just incrementing the start and end indexes and updating our sum variable. The next algorithm that we're going to focus on is not only common in coding interviews, but it's going to be common throughout your career. This is an algorithm that you're going to see very often, so it's something that you really want to thoroughly ingrain into your mind, and this is the binary search algorithm. Now it's important to note that for binary search to be applicable, there's a precondition we must meet. The data structure, in this case the array, that we are searching must be sorted. You'll see why this is the case soon, but for now let's consider an array that looks like this. Let's imagine that we want to find this value within this sorted array. The way binary search works is, we first find the middle value or midpoint of our array, and once we found the midpoint, we compare it to the value that we are trying to find. Since our array in this case is sorted in ascending order, any value that is greater than our middle value is going to be on the right side of our array, and any value that is less than our middle value is going to be on the left side of our array. And yeah, you guessed it. This means that we can determine which side of the array our target value is on by checking to see if it is greater than or less than our midpoint. And of course, if it's equal to our midpoint, then we found our value, but that's not the case just yet. So our target in this case is greater than our midpoint. And as you can see, any value that is greater than our midpoint will be on the right side of our array starting from the midpoint. So this means that we can now completely do away with the entire left side of our array, including the midpoint. So as you can see, compared to linear search where we would need to check every element on the left and right side of our array, being able to do away with an entire side in the case of binary search is very powerful. And there's more. We'll be able to do the same thing we just did when we check the right side of our array for our target as well. We'll first find the midpoint, then cut our search area in half once again with our new search side being determined by checking to see if our midpoint is greater than or less than our target. Eventually, our target will be our midpoint, or if our target doesn't exist within the array, it will just never be found. The next algorithm that you're likely to see in a coding interview is BFS or breadth first search. So let's go ahead and see how that works. Breadth first search means that we search the entire breadth of a level of a tree before moving down to the next level, starting with the topmost level of the tree. In other words, we will be traversing our tree in level order. A tree is just a set of linked nodes organized in a hierarchical way such that there is a root value and subtrees of children with a parent node. The way that we traverse a tree in a breadth first or level order manner is by making use of a queue. A queue is a data structure which is essentially a linked list where items are added and removed in first in first out order. For example, here's what it would look like to add some items to an empty queue. If we were to remove an item from this queue, we'd remove the first one that was added, and we'd continue to need to add and remove items in that order like so. 
At this point, you're probably wondering how this data structure helps us to traverse a tree. Well, essentially what we do is we start by adding the root of our tree to our queue as the first item to be processed. When we remove this item from the queue to be processed, we then add its children from left to right to be processed in the order that they are added. And of course, the root's children make up the next level of our tree. So after processing our topmost level, or the current level, which contains the root, we move on to processing the next item in the queue, which is the leftmost item of the next level. And for the first and subsequent items of this next level, we will do the same thing. Add their children to the queue from left to right to be processed. But notice that since a queue adds and removes items in first in, first out order, the next level's items will not be processed until we finish processing the current level's items. And this process is repeated until we reach the final level of the tree. And that is how we traverse a tree in a breadth first or level order manner. Our next algorithm is another graph traversal algorithm, and that is depth first search or DFS. The algorithm will differ slightly when dealing with graphs that are trees as opposed to graphs that aren't trees and vice versa. So let's start with what makes a graph a tree. A connected acyclic graph is called a tree. And acyclic is just a fancy way of saying that the graph contains no cycles. And connected graph is just a fancy way of saying that every node in the graph can reach any other node in the graph. Or every node has a path to any other node in the graph. So that means that the visualization that you're seeing now will work with the starting node being any of the nodes in the tree if the graph is a connected graph. So there are three traversal orders that we need to consider in regard to DFS on a tree, or DFS on a connected graph with no cycles. Those are in order, pre-order, and post-order. To understand these traversal orders, let's take a tree into consideration. If we want to search for the letter A in this tree, we can use DFS in either one of the before mentioned orders. So let's go with in order traversal. In order traversal simply means that we search each subtree in the order left, root, then right. So let's go ahead and emphasize the subtrees here. So here we have a subtree. Here we have another subtree, and here we have one more subtree. We start at the root of the whole tree, which is also the root of this subtree, and then we will first search the left node of this subtree, which is also the root node of this subtree. So in a depth first manner, we must search this subtree before moving on to the next node of our top level subtree. Next, we search the left of this subtree. The left of this subtree is a leaf node, which is just a node that doesn't have any children, so we've reached the maximum depth here. And this node doesn't contain our value, so we now can search the next node, which is the root node, when doing in-order traversal. So the root of this tree is here, so we can check this node. It doesn't contain our value either, so now we check this subtree's right node. That node also doesn't contain our value, so we move back up to the previous subtree. We left off at this subtree's left node, which we already checked, so now we move to this subtree's root node. This node doesn't contain our value, so we move to this subtree's right node. This right node is the root node of this subtree, so we start by checking this subtree's left node. That doesn't contain our value, so we move to this subtree's root node. This node doesn't contain our value, so we move to this subtree's right node. And this right node does contain our value, so we have found our value and can finish. And that is how DFS works when doing in-order traversal. The other traversal orders, pre-order and post-order, work in the same way. The only difference is the order in which you check nodes in each individual subtree. But regardless of the order, the search happens in a depth-first manner, hence depth-first search. So now that we've gotten traversal order out of the way, we need to understand the difference between DFS on a tree, or a graph that is a tree, and DFS on a graph. So the previous example was DFS on a tree. 
The most important thing to understand about DFS on a tree versus DFS on a graph is that trees do not have cycles, but graphs can have cycles. And as mentioned before, this is what a cycle looks like on a graph. A cycle is just a path that starts from one node and ends at that same node. As you can see here, our starting node is the same as our ending node. So what does that mean for our algorithm? Well, now we need to take into consideration the possibility of visiting a node twice. With the tree, it wasn't possible to visit the same node twice because a tree contains no cycles. So the algorithm for DFS on a tree is a tiny bit simpler. But don't worry, the algorithm doesn't change much for DFS on a graph. We just need to keep track of nodes that we've already visited. So let's take a cyclic graph into consideration. And a cyclic graph is simply a graph that contains one or more cycles. So we'll start at this node here. And as we visit the nodes, we'll mark them as visited by changing the color of the node to red. So when we get to this next node, there are two different directions that we can take. Which one we take doesn't matter because we haven't yet visited the nodes in either direction. So we can just pick one. And here we can only go in one direction. Same here, we can only go in one direction. Here, there are three directions that we can go, but one direction leads to an already visited node. So that one can be eliminated from the possibilities. Now we're left with two directions. Both lead to nodes that we haven't yet visited, so we can just pick one. Now, once we get to this node, the only direction that we can go leads to an already visited node. So that means that we now have to backtrack. We'll use orange to represent backtracking. Now we're back at the node where we had two possible paths. One path we have already visited, so now we're only left with the one path that we haven't yet visited. So once at this node, there's nowhere else for us to go. We've reached the depth. So all we can do is backtrack. Same here, nowhere else to go, so we backtrack. Same here, and same here. And remember here we had a choice between two paths, but we chose the one that we just backtracked from. But as you can see, with the chosen path, we were already able to visit the node that the other path option led to. So that node is already visited, so we just backtrack here as well. And the same with this last node. The other potential path was already visited, so we just backtrack. And since this is the starting node, we just return out of the algorithm at this point. So as you can see, we went all the way down to the deepest possible depth of the graph before returning to the starting node and checking the other paths. And that is why this is a depth first traversal. The next algorithm and the last algorithm that we're going to go over is going to incorporate DFS or depth first search, which is why I went over that algorithm first. And this last algorithm that we're going to go over is topological sort. We're going to go over a very widely used and common algorithm, topological sort. When considering topological sort, there are some constraints that we need to take into consideration. That is, topological sort can only be done on directed acyclic graphs, or DAGs. A directed graph is simply a graph whose edges are directed or have a direction. For example, this edge is directed towards this node, which means that there is a path to this node from this node, but there is no path back to this node from this node. This is in contrast with undirected graphs where the edges of the graph do not have directions. In the case of undirected edges, the edge can be traversed in either direction. So for topological sort to be applicable, the graph needs to be a directed graph. The other constraint is that the graph must be acyclic. And acyclic is just a fancy way of saying that the graph contains no cycles. And this is what I mean by a cycle. A cycle is just a path that starts from one node and ends at that same node. As you can see here, our starting node is the same as our ending node in this path. So no cycles means that we can never get back to a node once we've left it. 
And we'll get back to why these constraints are necessary later on in the video. For now, just know that topological sort can only be applied to DAGs, aka directed acyclic graphs. So let's start from the very basics. What is meant by topological? So the topology of a graph is just the arrangement of nodes and connections in a graph. And the key word here is arrangement. When looking at this DAG, we should ask ourselves what arrangement is trying to be achieved here. So let's imagine that each node in this graph is a task that needs to be completed. But there are tasks that cannot be completed unless some other task is completed first. So let's take a simple example into consideration. We want to bake a cake. And the tasks that need to be completed in order to bake a cake are, we need to go shopping and we need to buy eggs and oil. And we need to buy the mixing powder and make the mix for the cake. And we need to oil the pan and put the mix into the pan and we need to bake the cake. And finally, when all is said and done, we can eat the cake. Now, as you can see here, most of these nodes have dependencies. For example, we can't make the cake mix without first going shopping and buying eggs, oil, and mixing powder. So that means that this mix node has three in degrees. Now, don't get discouraged by the fancy terminology. In degrees is just the number of edges coming to the node and each edge coming to the node can be considered a dependency, which in other words means that making the mix for the cake depends on shopping, eggs, and oil. So three dependencies or in degrees. And in contrast, out degrees is just the number of edges going from the node. So this mix node has one out degree. So this arrangement of tasks and how they are connected to one another is the topology of the overall goal of baking and then eating a cake. And we can understand the topology of the graph by looking at the directed edges of the graph because they represent the dependencies of each node or task. So once we understand the topology or arrangement of task, all topological sort is doing is converting that arrangement from graph form to a linear ordering where each task comes after its dependencies. And that's actually what is meant by this confusing Wikipedia definition that says that topological ordering is a linear ordering of a graph's nodes where every directed edge UV blah blah blah. So now that we have an understanding of what topological sort is, we can now get into how we actually produce this linear structure using a topological sort algorithm on a directed acyclic graph. So there are a couple of ways to do topological sort. In this video, we're going to go over how to do it using depth first search, aka DFS. Also, keep in mind that there can be multiple topological orderings for a given graph. Anyways, to find a topological ordering using DFS, we also need to use a stack. So we're going to iterate through every node of the graph, and at each iteration, if that node has not been visited, we are going to do a depth first traversal with the current iterations node as the root node. And we'll mark every node as visited as we visit them. So this yellow box will represent our iterator. So just imagine that we are looping through every node in this graph and this yellow box is just saying where we're at in the loop. And we're going to go to the farthest point that we can reach or the maximum depth that we can reach from the node focused by the yellow box. So the node that is within the yellow box will be our root node at each iteration. So we'll start a depth first traversal at this node as our root. And we have one out degree, so that is the only path that we can take. And we end up here at node 2. And once again, we have one out degree, so that is the only path we can take, so we end up here at node 3. Now once we reach node 3, there are no more out degrees. So we've actually reached the maximum depth. So once we reach the maximum depth, we're going to add the value at this node to the stack. And don't worry, it'll become clear why we're doing this soon. After we add that value to the stack, we backtrack to node 2. And at node 2, before backtracking, we also add the value here to the stack. So whenever we're about to backtrack, right before backtracking, we should add the value at the node to the stack. So we backtrack again, and now we've arrived at our root node or our starting point. We then add the value at this node to the stack as well, and then backtrack. And backtracking in this case will take us out of the depth first traversal and back to our loop. So the loop will then iterate to the next node. 
So now our iterator arrives at node 2, but node 2 is marked as visited because as you saw we already visited it. So we'll just iterate up to node 3. Same thing here, we've already visited node 3 so we iterate up to node 4. Now node 4 is uncharted territory, so we'll start DFS with node 4 being our starting point or root node. Now this node has two out degrees, and it doesn't matter which path we take first, so we can just pick one here. But actually, one path leads to an already visited node, so we actually can't go that way. So now we're left with only one other path. So we'll take that path and move to node 5. Node 5 only has one out degree, therefore there's only one direction we can go here, but actually that out degree leads to an already visited node. So now it's time to backtrack. But before backtracking, we need to of course add the value at node 5 to the stack. Then we backtrack to node 4, add its value to the stack, and then backtrack again, which brings us back to the iterator or the loop. So we'll iterate up to 5 and see that it's visited, so then we iterate up to 6. Now 6 has two out degrees, but both of them lead to visited nodes. So actually all we can do at node 6 is backtrack, but before that we can't forget to add the value to the stack. Then we backtrack, and at this point we've iterated through all of the nodes, so our loop will terminate. So at this point, we've added all of the nodes values to our stack, and actually the order that these nodes occupy in the stack from top to bottom is one topological ordering of this graph. So we can then just pop all of these items off the stack to get our ordering, and this works because a stack is last in first out, which means that the last item added to the stack will be the first to be removed. So we remove these items from top to bottom, and what we're left with is one topological ordering for this graph. So now we're left with the question of why DFS actually works here, and the answer is actually so simple that it might seem difficult to understand. So you'll notice that every edge in the graph leads to the node that the edge is coming from's depender. So the node that we're coming from when following the edge is the dependency of the node that we're going to. So that means that every node previous to the current node that we're at when following the directed edges is a dependency for that current node. So basically whenever we do a DFS, once we've reached the depth for that DFS, we've actually just traversed a mini topological ordering. So that means that we kind of already have multiple mini topological orderings within the graph. So all this algorithm is doing is adding all of these mini topological orderings together into one big topological ordering. And we're combining all of these mini topological orderings using the stack. And at this point, it should be pretty obvious why there can't be cycles in the graph as mentioned in the beginning of the video, because if there are cycles in the graph, there can be no topological ordering because what would be the last node in the ordering if we're in a cycle? And same goes for why the edges must be directed. If they aren't directed, there's no way to know which node depends on which node when considering two nodes connected by an undirected edge, because remember, the directed edge points to the depender. And yeah. That's going to be it for a topological sort, and if you've reached this point in the video, you've obviously found this video useful, so please leave a like. Don't be stingy. Anyways, I'll see you in the next one.